Good day, this is Jim Patel from Columbia Gorge Community College Renewable Energy Technology Program. This is ET122 Digital 2. Today we're going to discuss how to set up the 555 as an oscillator. Okay, key thing is, is remembering what is inside a 555 timer. So remember, 3, 2, 1, 1, 1, and the bonus features. Okay, 3, 1, 2, 3 identical resistors. And to make things a little bit clear, if the three identical resistors hooked up in such a fashion, one could easily just go ahead and remove them. And according to the voltage divider rule, go ahead and replace our minus and plus inputs on our comparator A and B with 3.3 volts, 1.67 volts. Okay just makes the diagram a little bit easier. Yes, through the bonus features with use of the control, you can change the threshold and triggering to different levels. Okay, so we did the three. The two, comparator A and B. So two voltage comparators, they're not binary number comparators, they're voltage comparators, where the output of a voltage comparator, if the plus is higher than the minus, it's gonna produce a one, and if the minus is higher than the plus, it's going to produce a zero. Okay, so we got the two, one. What's the one? This guy, an SR latch, hooked up upside down, and it's taken our output not to Q. What's the next one? The discharge transistor. Okay, what turns on a discharge transistor is a one right here. And if there's a one on this base of a transistor, you could easily redraw this as a no resistance path to ground. But if it's a zero, you could easily re redraw it as an open switch, meaning an infinite resistance to ground. Okay, so that's our transistor. And then last one, is our inverting buffer because not Q is being fed into it, we want Q on the output. Okay, so setting up the 555 timer as an oscillator is a little different than when we set it up as the A stable multi vibrator. We're going to go ahead and show you how to do that along with some formulas to determine the duty cycle and the pulse width. Okay, so the key thing in setting up a 555 as a A-stable multivibrator is that connection right there. Threshold and trigger are tied together, and they are in turn tied to the top of a capacitor, hooked to ground. Okay, so initially we're going to assume that the capacitor is uncharged. So that voltage there is zero volts. What is happening to the comparator A and comparator B outputs? Well, comparator A, it's got 3.3 volts here on the minus, and it's got zero volts on the plus. So 3.3 on the negative input is actually higher than the positive input zero volts, so what it's going to produce is a zero. And it's not going to reset the latch. But now, comparator B, what's it going to do? Well, it's got a 1.67 on the plus, which is higher than the minus input of zero volts, so it's going to do one, and it's going to set the latch. But since we are taking not Q, it's going to be a zero here. And remember what, according to our discharge transistor here, when a zero is applied to the base, one could easily just draw that as an open circuit, meaning there's no path to ground. Okay, so how is that discharge hooked up? Well, the discharge is hooked up to a resistor right here, which I'm going to call R2. and another R1, which is hooked to plus 5. Okay, so now, with this path, 
being open right here. There's no way current can go through this path. Where's all that current going to go? Well, it's going to go this way and start charging up that capacitor. OK? So one thing that should immediately come to your mind right now, what is the time constant for the charging portion of it? Well, since the current is going from plus 5 up here, it has to fight through resistor 1 and resistor 2 to get to the capacitor. Basically, the time, oh, excuse me, time constant 1 for the charging portion is R1 plus R2, our total resistance, times C1 which if we were only charging through one resistor, it would be faster. But now that we're charging through two resistors, it's going to be slower, OK? So now if we were to draw a graph of the charging capacitor, let's make that a little bit bigger. Let's say it started at zero, and it's increasing. There's a couple points to be concerned about. It reaches 1.67 volts, and it continues to climb. OK, so what happens when it reaches 1.67 volts? Well, look at comparator B. This minus input here suddenly becomes larger than the plus input. And the output of comparator B goes to a 0. So since the latch was set originally, it's not going to do anything to the output not Q. And the discharge transistor is going to still be an open circuit, and it's still going to allow it to continue to charge. But now it reaches 3.3 volts. OK, at 3.3 volts, threshold becomes greater, because it's still continuing to increase, than the, than the minus input of comparator A. And this changes to a 1. Now things start happening. It's resetting the latch, which should put Q to 0. OK, so when Q is 0, not Q becomes a 1, and it turns the discharge transistor on. Once the discharge transistor is on, you could easily replace this open circuit with a short circuit. Now what happens? Well, current ceases to flow in this direction, because now there's an easy path to ground for the capacitor to discharge through one resistor only to ground. And now what we get is time constant 2 is equal to R2 times C1. And we discharge. Once it discharges below 3.3 volts, what happens here? Comparator A outputs a 0. But since we are already in a reset condition, and we've got 0, 0 here, it's nothing's going to change. The discharge capacitor, excuse me, discharge transistor is still going to be on until it falls down to 1.67 volts. What happens there? Well, at 1.67 volts, then when the capacitor is charged up to 1.67 volts, excuse me, it's fallen to 1.67 volts, the trigger uh, is less than the 1.67 right here. So the output B goes to a 1, and it sets the latch, making not Q a 0 and opening up our discharge transistor. And guess what happens? starts charging up 
to 3.3 volts, 1.67, and you can loop this tape back to where I started. So what you get is this continual oscillating capacitor input, but since these are digital pulses, as we showed, it goes from 0 to 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. What's the output here? Well, it's the inversion of that. And you get a stable oscillating signal. So what determines the frequency of, the, of this arrangement here? Well, it's obviously our resistor 1 and 2 and our capacitor. OK, traditionally, yes, those are the time constants for a straight up RC network. But since we're dealing with the 555 timer, there's a little bit of idiosyncrasies with it. And how I'm going to do this here is basically our time high, because that's our charging time, is going to be 0.7 times R1 plus R2 times C1. Our time low is going to be 0.7 times R2, C1, because that's the time it takes to discharge. That's the time it takes to charge. So you should already see here, OK, wait a second. Time high may not be, oh, that's supposed to be an L. Sorry, guys. Time high may not be equivalent to time low. Because typically, we've been dealing with clocks that have a 50% duty cycle, where it's down as far as it is up. OK, so 50% duty cycle. Well, it looks like almost 50% for that one. But now, what if we wanted something with less of a duty cycle? Or we wanted something with more of a duty cycle. It's still the same frequency for this guy. Because remember, let's say we're using positive edge triggering. Well, it's almost the same frequency. This guy's a little bit faster. But this is a less duty cycle. Let's call this a 10% duty cycle, because it's only on 10% of the time. Let's call it 20% to be fair. What's this guy's duty cycle? It looks like 80 to 90%. But again, what matters is this positive edge triggering. It's that frequency. That's the frequency. That's the period, let's say, um, here's 10 milliseconds between here and there. 10 milliseconds. Between here and here, it's still 10 milliseconds. Between here and here, 10 milliseconds. So we still have the same frequency for two pulses with two different duty cycles. Which one uses less power? That guy. OK, so you can save yourself some power, but still have the same frequency. Less of a duty cycle. How do you change the duty cycle? with these formulas up here. So I'm going to redraw this one up here. So it's, I still want a frequency of 100 hertz, because that's 1 over 10 milliseconds there. I wanted to make it look good here. So the all these guys are three 100 hertz signals. But one has a 50% duty cycle, one has a 20% duty cycle, one has a 90% duty cycle. And again, if we're all we're concerned with is the positive edge triggering, or for this matter, a negative edge triggering, it doesn't matter what the duty cycle is, as long as we've got a regular beat every 1 10 millisecond, every 10 milliseconds. So given it takes this long, we're here to charge up, and this long to discharge, what is the total period of that? 
well, period, should be the time high plus the time low. Now the time something is high, the time it's low, time it's high, time it's low, basically the repetitive portion of it is right there and right there. Between here and here should be the same value, th, tl, th, tl. According to these formulas up here, we do a little bit of a uh, mathematical simplification. What you get is 0.7 C1 R1 plus R2. Okay. How do you, you know, since we've typically been dealing with 50% uh, duty cycles, how do you make it exactly 50%? Well, why not make R1 and R2 equal to each other, but you're like, hey, wait a second, that wouldn't work because it'd be charging through twice as much and discharging through half as much, that wouldn't work. But here, hear me out. Make them equal to each other. But put a diode there, okay? So what happens? when it's charging. When it's charging, it's going to go through R1. It gets to this point. It's got a decision to make. I can fight through R2 or go through this easy current path there through the diode. So it's only going through R1. Now, during the discharge, the capacitor, and again, we've got to close our discharge transistor, the capacitor is going to, want to, going to want to discharge to ground. It gets to this point. It's got a choice to make. I can try to fight my way through a diode, which is not going to let it, because remember, it's almost like a check valve for current. Or it can go through R2 and discharge to ground. What you get here is a situation where if you've through this little diode right here, you've created a situation where time high is equal to 0.7 R1 C1, time low 0.7 R2 C1. If R1 and R2 are exactly equal to each other, you've got a perfect 50% duty cycle. You want something less than a 50% duty cycle, i.e. something like this, where your time high is substantially lower, make R1 smaller. You want a, let's say, a larger duty cycle, say 90% here. You want your charging time to be a little bit longer, make R1 higher. Pretty cool. Just the ratio of R1 and R2 determines our duty cycle. That's it for the 555 timer. Um, I certainly hope by this quarter we get at least one lab on the 555.